Good to see y'all. Good to see you all. All right, let's pray and we'll get started. Dear Lord, I love you and I just praise you, Father God. I thank you for this beautiful day, Lord, and I just pray that you be here with us this morning, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds and, uh, and that you just speak to us here this morning, Lord, and I pray that we be obedient to heed to um, heed to your Holy Spirit, Lord, Heavenly Father. And we just love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So um, today I'm going to take some time and just talk about uh, just who we are in Christ. And um, I was thinking about this from what I preached on last week about uh, about just doing the work of God. You know how we spend all this time working for ourselves and um, just investing in ourselves and how we need to be just investing our whole life into the work of God. And, uh and like I said, he's called all of us to his work. And, you know, I think about that sometimes when, you know, I preach messages like that. And I think sometimes we just feel unqualified to do stuff for God. And, um, and we make excuses. You know, people do. I've done too much wrong. I've done this wrong. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not qualified. And you got to understand, all your excuses, you have to funnel them into Christ because he's your righteousness. He's your qualification. He's all that stuff. We ain't, none of us are. Not, nobody in here is qualified. On my own, I'm not qualified. On your own, none of us are. None of us are good enough. But that's why we have Jesus Christ. He's what makes us good enough. He's what, he is our enough. It's Jesus. And, uh, and you know, 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 and 31 says, says this. If you got them excuses, this is what it says here. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He says, There ain't no wise, not the noble, not the mighty. These aren't the ones look, but God God had chosen but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And see, that right there, whenever, whenever I read that, he's telling you, he's saying, look, God chose, he chooses weak things. He chooses despised things. He chooses, you know, if you, if you're, uh, you know, we all feel that way sometimes, unqualified and all that stuff. And whatever we do, we have to understand that God works through those things. He works through weaknesses. That's where he's made strong. That's why Paul says, he says, I'd much rather boast in my weaknesses than my strength so that Christ can be made strong within me, right? Because that's where Christ is glorified. And, uh, and we see this over in the story of uh, David over in 1 Samuel chapter 1 or 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read through this a little bit and talk about it because David knew who he was in the Lord. He did. He walked in confidence. He didn't care what people said about him, what they thought about him. He knew. That's just how he knew God. He was, he was just close to him. He knew who he was. And, uh, and it says this. I'm going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 17 verse 28. And it says, now, Eliab, now, just coming up to this verse, David, he's been, he's already been anointed, right? God sent Samuel to anoint him. And uh, his brothers, they go off, they're off in this battle against the Philistines. And his dad's like, look, I want you to go check on your brothers. So here comes measly old David. His brother's already, they're not big fans of him. He's like that, the outcast kid, right? His brother, like when they come to anoint him, they bring all the brothers forward. And they're like, well, there got to be one more. And they're like, oh, well, there's old David out there in the field, right? So they go get him. But that's what God uses. He uses the runt of the litter and makes him the boss hog. That's what he did with David. He was the boss dog. He said, he might be a runt, but I'm going to show you something with him. And so starting there in 28, David, David's dad sends him down to check on his brother. And it says, and Goliath's over here. He's threatening the Philistines and everything, and they're all scared of him. And, uh, and this is how this goes. It says, Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, 
And Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? His brother's like, Ain't you supposed to be tending sheep? What you doing down here? And it says, I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. See, he's telling David, he's like, he's trying to discourage him is what he's doing. He's aggravated with him. He's like, what are you doing down here? You're all proud and coming down here. You know, you shouldn't be down here. You need to go back and get with them sheep and do what you're supposed to be doing. And it says, and David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the, said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first one did. Now, when the words of which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to. Here's another discouraging. You ain't able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth. He's like, you're, you're young. His brothers are already trying to discourage him. Then you got this guy. He's like, dude, you're a kid. What are you going to do? Do you know who are you? And that's how we feel sometimes, right? Like, who am I? And the world looks down on people like that. Like, what can you do? And people do in church to some folks. Like, what can they do for the Lord? I'm telling you what, if you focus on Jesus Christ and you cling to him, you can do great things. God can do great things through you. He can some of the greatest men of men and women that have ever that you read about in history they come from nothing and the one thing that made them great was the name of jesus christ that's what made them great they didn't do nothing all they did was cling to god cling to christ and he made he did great things in their lives and he'll do the same thing in your life you can, it, but you got to understand who you are in jesus christ have confidence in it like david does he has confidence in who he in who god is that's his whole story. It's just a confident, when he goes up against Goliath, he's confident in God. He's like, I know, I know, without a doubt, God's going to destroy you. And the reason why is because you stand up against him. He's going to take you out. And look, it says, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. And he goes on, he says, Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. You know, I read that most guys David's age, when they're telling this story about killing this lion and bear, they'd have been like, Yeah, I'm a beast. I get out there and I just rip beards out of lines. I tear down bears. But look, he doesn't. He's like the Lord delivered me from him. It wasn't just me. I know me when I was young. I'd been like, yeah, you should. Let's go bear hunting. Bear handed. I mean, <laughs> you know, you just think about it. Like he, he's not, he's not being what, you know, his brother said, you're down here in your pride and insolence. He's like, no, I'm coming down here just to do what my dad said. And now look at him. He's like. He's like, the Lord who delivered me out of that will deliver this Philistine. And, uh, and then, so David, we'll just read it. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag and a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was only youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? See, there's his intimidation. Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Who are you? You little little old kid. But check David out. It says, And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword 
and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defiled. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. With all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You just see his confidence all throughout that. And you know, I get whenever I read that story and uh, and I and I just think about the, the confidence David had, and then you know you see Goliath coming at him, yelling at him, you know, just adding on to the. He already has these people over here, his own family, telling him he ain't nobody, and then he has the enemy coming at him, telling him he ain't nobody. And you look at his confidence, and it's all because he how close he was to God. He knew who God was. He knew who he was with God, and that's what he and that's what he hung on to, and that's what we have to do. And I, you know, I thought of John. T you know, one of Satan's things he wants us to he doesn't want us to realize who we are in Christ. He's a type of Goliath. You know, he is. He rears his big old ugly head, and he sits there and puts these thoughts in people's minds. Everybody has them. I ain't good enough. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't. You know. My testimony don't mean nothing. All I've sinned, I've failed. I can't serve God no more, right? He, he does these things. He, he, that's what he does. John 10, 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, I come so that they would have life and have it abundantly. See, Satan, he wants to steal. He, 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 want, he doesn't want you to realize who you are in Christ because he knows, look, if you do, you're going to be something to reckon with. Because God, I'm telling you, when people cling to Christ, what they can do, and the, and the thing is, folks got to understand, and there's three things people have to realize, and, and I, these three are what, what affect my life more than anything. And the first one is the fact that, and this is just talking about who I am in Christ, and the first one is the fact that I'm forgiven, right? You have to realize that, that you're a forgiven person, that when sin rears its ugly head, look, I'm forgiven of my sin. All my past stuff, I, I can't let that define who I am no longer. I have to let Jesus Christ and his life and what he's done in my life define my future. If you sit there and look at your past all day long, look, you're going to fail. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be downtrodden. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our wrong, our wrongdoings, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. And that's what he's talking about. In Christ, we're, we're forgiven of our sin, right? Everyone knows this is basic Christianity right here. We know it, right? We're forgiven people. Isaiah one eighteen says, Come now and let us debate your case, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And, and you know, our sin, it no longer defines who we are. We're new creatures in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 19 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And not only... Uh, you know, I always think about forgiving, being forgiven of my sin, and I think about, you know, how so many people, they, uh, there's a lot of Christians, and they do, they live in sin. They do. And, and I always think about that, and, and they feel convicted of their sin, but they just don't know how to get over it. And one thing that I learned back, back when I was coming off drugs and alcohol is I, I used to spend all this time focusing on alcohols and drugs right like oh I gotta I gotta sit here and fix these things they're my problem and when and all actually when all in all honesty they were never my problem my problem was sin and that's everybody's problem and people don't understand this if, if you just focus on alcohol you're just gonna be it'd be like just picking these fruits off of this right you still got a root down in here that stuff's gonna keep popping up if you keep just picking fruit. That's why you have to deal with sin in itself. And the only place that's dealt with is in Christ. 
and I've learned in my life, when I focus on Jesus Christ, when he's my all in all, my number one, those things just kind of go to the wayside. I don't have to try to not be an alcoholic. I don't have to try to not be a drug addict. It just, it just happened. That's the fruit of God being produced in a person's life. And people have to understand that. And Jesus Christ forgives us of our sin, right? He, he forgives us. He clears it. He makes us a new creature. He takes our sin and he nails it to the cross. It's nailed up there. It's done with. That's what Colossians 2, 13 and 14 says. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our wrongdoings, having canceled the certificate of death consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Nailed straight to the cross. Your sin was paid for on that cross. Our sin was paid for on that cross. And that's why we have to focus on Jesus Christ. If we sin is the issue, it's not the, yes, drugs and things are a problem, but you have to understand they come from our, from sin. That's where that stuff's rooted in. It's just like people who are pornography and things like that, stealing, lying, all that stuff. That's what it's rooted in. And if you just focus on that, you'll just be picking fruit and not digging up the root cause of the problem. And uh, Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our wrongdoings from us. That's how much he's forgiven us. So far as the east. You can't even put a number on that. He's, he says that's how much he's forgiven you. He's, he's forgiven it, throwing it out like it's, it's gone. In Christ, it's gone. He's just throwing it out. Um, and the great thing about being... You know, not only are we forgiven of our sin, right, the once and for all, we're also, it continues. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So it's something that he continually does. We can, he, he don't just, you know, he casts our sin off, right? But he also continually offers us forgiveness of our sin as we, as we live for him, right? As we're serving him, right? We fail, we fall. We mess up, we stump our toe and all that stuff. We look to Jesus Christ and he offers us continual forgiveness. And, uh, and we just got to learn that, like 1 Corinthians one thirty says, that Jesus Christ is our righteousness, right? It says, but it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And that's where... Uh, I, I forgot where I, I was at a, doing some men's deal one day and some guy was uh, they were talking about like witnessing for Christ and this one guy he uh, I don't know he he said something about he said man I feel bad witnessing for Christ when I you know I don't always live right I mess up and do this and the pastor turned around and he said I'll tell you what when you mess up and when you're not doing right that don't cancel out the fact that you shouldn't speak up for Christ. He said, you have to allow Jesus to be your righteousness. Jesus Christ is your righteousness. He is. And you, you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. We all do. But we have to understand that Christ is our righteousness. And not only is, are we forgiven, but we're adopted into God's family. And this is something, uh, you know, there's people out there, they ain't got a family. They don't. They don't even know what a family is, but when they come to Christ, they're part of a family. The best, the heavenly family, the spiritual, the greatest family you can ever be a part of. I guarantee you, I'd much rather be, have no earthly family and have a heavenly one than not have a heavenly one and have an earthly one. Just being straight up true. Because all this stuff's going to pass away over here. The one thing that's going to still be living is that heavenly. In uh, Ephesians 1, 5, and 6 says, He predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he has favored on us in the beloved. And that just right there just sums it up that we're adopted into the family of God when we're saved through Jesus Christ. He not only forgives us, Jesus don't only forgive us, he's not only our righteousness, redemption, sanctification, but he also is our He's, a, he's what gets us adopted. We actually share in his life. 
what I mean we're adopted we become heirs of Christ heirs of God through Jesus Christ Galatians 4 3 and 7 says so we too when we were children were held in bondage under the elementary principles of the world but when the fullness of the time came God sent his son born of a woman born under the law so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters because you are sons God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying out Abba father therefore you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an heir through God see that a lot of folks say, man, I ain't never going to get an inheritance. Boy, if you know Jesus Christ, you're going to get a real nice inheritance. You're going to get to be able to go into heaven, right? You got. He said, my father got many mansions there. You might live in a trailer on earth or a cardboard box, but you get to heaven, you're going to live in a, it's going to be nice. And that's why, that's why I always tell people, you have to focus on that stuff because the world is hard. It's a hard place. That's why, uh, this, what's that hymn? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You know, that's that pilgrim, that pilgrimage. You know, what, what, when somebody's on a pilgrimage, what are they focused on? Where they're going. And that's how we need to be. And that's what we are. We're just passing through this earth. That's all it is. This earth is here today and gone tomorrow. And that's when we have to focus on the Lord, have to focus on God. But to do that and to be confident in it, you got to understand who God is. You do. You got to understand who you are in Christ. And that's why these things like for being forgiven, being the fact that I'm adopted, that I'm actually a son of God through Christ. Like that's a true statement. That's just not me saying something like that's real. It's just as real as my dad is to me is the fact that I'm a son of God. It's, it's even realer than that. Spiritual things are real or I'm going to say realer, real little. No, really. It sounds better. <laughs> but these, I mean, it's these things that when I read, they, they motivate me. They give me confidence. And that's just why I wanted to share them today. But, uh, and also on the adopted part, John 1, 12 and 13 says, But as many as received him, to, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood nor of the will, of the flesh nor the will of man but of God as many as believed in him as many as believed in him he gave the right to be children of God and so if you know Christ you're forgiven he's your righteousness he's your sanctification redemption you're adopted you're part of the family of God right he's your dad and the best one is is that we're loved there's nothing greater than the love of God the fact that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. There's no absolute nothing greater. And I know last week I said, talked about, you know, God's love. It, and it's not coddly love like some people think. Like a, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but like a liberal love. Y'all know what I mean? <laughs> it's a, it's a it, it has boundaries, you know what I mean? But it's, it's just amazing how much God loves us. And, uh, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And I always think, even when I was a dirtbag piece of junk, Jesus was there. <clears throat> you know, when we were dead in our trespasses and he, sins, he sent Christ to die for it. That's amazing. That's love like we could never imagine. 1 John 4, 10 says, in this, in, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, 15 and 18 says, for whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed that Believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and the, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, we also are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is perfected in love. You know, I think about that last verse, there's no fear 
and love, but perfect love drives out fear. Uh, you know, I think about a, a son like me and Kyson. He, I just, he's not afraid when he's around me. They, you know, he might get scared somewhere, but if he was to run to me, he wouldn't be afraid. He, there's no fear with me because he knows I love him, right? He knows I'll take care of him, I'll protect him. While, yes, he would be disciplined, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, it's, do y'all understand how I'm explaining that? Like, like yeah, I discipline my kids and stuff like that. They're disciplined and they're, uh, they're held to a pretty high standard, but they know, like, if they're with me, they're protected, they're safe. I'll take care of them. They know I'll forgive them. If they do something wrong, I ain't going to just throw them out, you know? That's how a lot of people think with Christianity. They think. And, and you have some hard-nosed people out there who will be like that. Oh, they're living in sin. They ain't saved. Now, don't get me wrong. If somebody's whole life has been living in sin and they're saying they know Jesus, they probably don't know Jesus. But for a Christian to go off and mess up, you cannot say that they just, that they've lost their salvation because they're out there messing up. That's not God's still going to be drawing them. He's still going to be pulling them to himself. That's the love of God. It'd be just like you if your kids went off astray. You ain't just going to be like, birth certificate gone. They're not my kid no more. You wouldn't do that. You're going to be doing what you can to pull them back. That's how God is. And that's what his spirit does. He's there to draw us back, pull us back to him. That's in his love. He's provided these things for, for us. And uh. And, and, you know, I think about the discipline. I don't know if any of you have ever felt the discipline of God, but I have, you know, deep conviction. And to me, that proves how much God loves me more than anything. You know, yes, the fact that he sent Christ proves his love for us. I mean, the Bible tells us that. But in my heart, like I know whenever I'm convicted, when I do things wrong, that proves to me how much God loves me. And I, and I thought about this and Proverbs 13, 34 says this. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And then listen to Hebrews 12, 6. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he punishes every son whom he accepts. You see, that proves to me God loves me because he convicts my heart. Sometimes I get under deep conviction for being just a knucklehead, and you know what? It sucks for the time, but whenever you whenever you repent, you turn back to God or you get your heart right with God or your eyes back on the Lord, whatever he's doing, it's just you just know God loves you. It just it so proves to me God loves me. And we have to understand that that there's nothing wrong with being convicted when you do something wrong. Don't let that discourage you. It's okay if it hurts your feelings. It's all right to have hurt feelings, but we just got to get over them sometimes and keep moving forward. And uh, lastly, I'm going to read Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39 says this. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely get... How shall he not... With not with him also freely give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. You see that? Who can bring a charge against you? It's God who justifies. Who, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are made more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. You can't be severed from the love of God. You can't be, and, and you got to understand that. You might mess up. You might fall. Things in your life bad may happen. You might get sick. You might die, whatever it is. But guess what? God still loves you. Just because things get bad don't mean he doesn't love you. 
Just because you fall on your face and make a mistake, it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. He's the perfect father. And we have to cling to him and have confidence in him and know you've got to understand in him you're forgiven, in him you're adopted, you're part of his family, in him you're loved. He's your righteousness, saint. he's your everything. He's our all in all. He's our holiness, he's our everything. And when we set him up as the center of all that we do, I'm telling you, you can, have, you can walk in confidence anywhere you go, especially when you take Jesus Christ with you and when you're focused on him and understanding who you are in him. And I just challenge you, you know, focus on him, get in the scriptures, learn his promises and stuff like that. One thing God can't do, and I know for sure, is lie. So if he has a promise in the Bible that is directed towards you, it's true. Guaranteed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I love you, and I thank you for your word, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that we all that we all can just walk in confidence, Lord God, knowing who we are in you, Lord. And I just pray that we don't have to be scared of the economy or war or None of this crazy stuff going on, Lord God, that, um, that we know that you hold the whole world in your hand. And, and you'll see to it how it'll go how you want it to go, Lord God. And we just pray that, that your perfect and precious will be done in this world, Lord God, and in our lives and in this church, Lord. And I pray that you bless each and every person that's here this morning and that you uh, just pave the way for their day as they leave here, Lord God. And we love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ.